Who knew that growing older could be so sexy and so much fun? What say we get out the Ouija board and scare up our husbands? Shop the cork off his junk? I said, I couldn't say that. My father watches this show. From 1985 to 1992, the Golden Girls shot to the top of the ratings charts and made these ladies the hottest babes on the tube. Bye. Well, sperm used to be free. It was all over the place. In the next two hours, we'll show you why Dorothy, Rose, Blanche, and Sophia had a standing date with millions of devoted admirers every Saturday night. Sri Lanka? Will you tell me what in Sri Lanka they see in four old ladies living together? With exclusive interviews, rare footage, and hilarious clips, we'll reveal the secrets behind the boudoir doors in the Gals Miami bungalow. Are you going to believe me if I tell you? And we'll hear how these talented ladies became the surprising sweethearts of prime time. Could never happen in real life, but it made for great TV. Thank you for being a friend. This is TV Tales, The Golden Girls. Cat, look at you. But to tell you the truth, I was hoping you'd use my wedding dress. That's nice, Ma. As what? A hand puppet? When B. Arthur's character Dorothy's Bordak said, I do, in 1992, millions of devoted fans said goodbye to the Golden Girls. Oh, I miss you. For seven years, these four ladies broke all the television stereotypes of senior citizens. The Golden Girls were funny. I'm gonna be dead in 24 hours. Couldn't you stay in the closet for one more day? Independent. Believe what you want, see if I care. Hypersexual bitch. And they didn't mind getting a little bit naughty. Well, sure you do, Dorothy. Remember, you thought you were grabbing Stan's parking brake. The fact that these were all older women who are not only clean and well-groomed and well-coiffed and well-dressed, who also had active sex lives. It was exciting. Damn it, Dorothy, if you'd have sex in public more often, this kind of thing wouldn't happen. It was revolutionary in that it was using women as its leads, women over 50, which was, oh my word, so daring and unheard of. We were like four points on a compass. We were so different from each other and yet we all somehow meshed. The inspiration for this diverse mix came from an unlikely source. In 1984, NBC was promoting its fall lineup with a preview special. At the taping, actresses Doris Roberts and Selma Diamond appeared in a sketch to pitch a new series called Miami Vice. We're here to introduce a show that takes place in the most wonderful resort in the world, Miami. Warren Littlefield was head of comedy development at NBC. Selma Diamond kept saying, Miami nice. And Doris Roberts would say, no, Selma, no. This is a show about sitting on the beach. No, 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 Selma, honey, no, no, no. This show is not called Miami nice. This is called Miami vice. Doris, don't do this no, no, to me. No, no, it's all right, it's all right, don't worry. Don't worry. Those two ladies were really hysterical. Doris was on Remington Steel, Selma was on Night Court. But we realized that they were tapping into voices that just weren't on television. We said, well, why don't we do something with that? Littlefield pitched the concept to NBC chief Brandon Tartikoff, who liked the idea. I think the whole network felt there was a, a, a segment of the audience that was not being addressed. The older, the older audience didn't have their place in the sun, really. Warren Littlefield discussed the notion with the producers of the sitcom Soap and Benson. Paul Witt and Tony Thomas came in with another writer, and they were pitching me a show about a young female attorney. I kind of yawned and, and said, you know, I'm really not interested in that show. Let me tell you the show I'm interested in doing. We Warren said, there's a chemistry there, and there's a funniness to these kinds of people, and to this kind of an age group, we'd love to capture it. Uh, you know, think about some women who live together, a couple ladies who live together, and so on. And that's basically what they gave us. And the writer looked at me and said, well, I, I don't see that at all. And they left the room, and then Paul and Tony kind of walked the writer out to the hallway, 
and then they ran back into my office. We said, wait a minute, we think we know someone who can uh, really write this wonderfully. And they said, well, maybe it's something we can interest Susan in. And I said, Susan Harris? And they said, yes. Susan Harris was one of Hollywood's premier comedy writers and producers. Her resume included edgy sitcoms like Maud and Soap. Soap tackled issues, the, the gay son, you know, the priest that was in love with whoever. She was never afraid to tackle issues. If there was any issue out there, she would tackle it. And that's, that's her reputation. And we then went back to Susan and said, good news, they want to talk about rich, interesting characters, you know, and not just 20-year-olds, uh, and uh, people with long lives and, and history and, and stories to tell, and that's right up Susan's alley. It's a portion of the population, like I said, that's been ignored, that really needed a voice, needed representation. But Harris wasn't sold. Littlefield got on the phone himself. And she said, well, I really like the idea. I mean, I could write this, but will you guys ever put it on? And my response was, if you write it, then we will put it on. We'll have to put it on because it'll be so compelling and it will be so wonderfully entertaining. And she took the challenge. I didn't set out to teach so much as okay. number one, entertain, and number two, show people that life goes on and can be exciting and full. One can be independent, attractive, vital after the age of 40, after the age of 50. Susan Harris took a crack at a pilot script. She decided the Golden Girls weren't going to spend their days in rocking chairs. These women had jobs, boyfriends, and most importantly, each other. From the time I read the first draft, I was screaming with laughter. I was running around my house, grabbing anyone I could find and saying, listen to this, listen to this, I've got to read this scene to you. We had one of the great pilot scripts ever written by someone who was at the time probably the best writer in television. So we had gold, no pun intended. We really wanted to make sure you, you can't make mistakes in television casting. The four leading roles were up for grabs. There was Rose, the naive widow from Minnesota, Blanche, the southern siren, Dorothy, the sarcastic school teacher, and Sophia, Dorothy's smart-mouthed mother. One of the interesting things that happened is this show came one year after The Cosby Show. And a light bulb went off for us. We realized that we had tapped into a casting pool that had been underused. And as we went into the development of Golden Girls, what we said is, you know, these women are not starring in feature films. There's wonderful talent out there. So we were out there reading everyone except uh, for B's part. Yeah, and you got to get lucky. You know, you got, they got to be available. And that can kill you right there. Dorothy, Rose, Blanche, and Sophia were great roles for any actress. But the producers were picky, and their patience was about to pay off. Oh, I do love the rain so. It reminds me of my first kiss. Uh, your first kiss was in the rain. No, it was in the shower. <laughs> in November 1984, the creative team behind the Golden Girls had a terrific script. They sent the pilot to a number of veteran actresses who knew a thing or two about sitcoms. 49-year-old Rue McClanahan starred in the 1970s hit Maud. The minute Rue read the script, she wanted in. When I began to read it, I said, oh my lord, this is just exactly what I want to do. This is the one I want to do. I want to do Blanche. I know how to do Blanche. But producers had another actress in mind for the part of the flirtatious Southern Belle, Blanche Devereaux. They wanted Betty White who is best known for her role on the Mary Tyler Moore Show as Sue Ann Nivens, the horny homemaker. They had me originally playing Blanche. They had sort of written it with that in mind. And I called my agent and I said, I love this script and I want to audition for Blanche. And she said, forget it. They've got Betty White practically pegged for that role. It's just almost set. They've almost offered it to her. They want you to look at the role of Rose. Producers thought Rue McClanahan was right for the part of the terminally innocent Rose Nyland. They believe Rue's hilarious portrayal of Maud's ditzy neighbor Vivian made her the perfect choice. We had them come in to read for the parts, and Jay Sandridge, who directed our pilot, said, why don't we consider flopping Betty and Rue for the parts, because B 